I just think it's, it's fun to think about the future. This is the future. It really is. It's pretty cool. Um, so I am supposed to bring us back down to earth, though, bring us back down to the present, what we're doing now, um, and talk about kind of what we do and what we see at our businesses. Um, you know if you're an energy efficiency person, if you walk into a business like this, right? <laughs> and you're looking at the lights, and you're thinking, they're hot, and um, you're going up to the roof, and you're seeing the potential on the roof, you're seeing if there's, if they have chargers out in the parking lot, you want to look at their bill and see if they're peak use, you're looking for the little mini splits, maybe, I don't know. There's a bunch of potential. We see lots of opportunity as a business. But what do we not see when we look at our businesses? There's lots of barriers. And you really, you have to know those barriers and you have to see the barriers first. Um, most of them rent their space. They don't own their space. A lot of them don't have a rooftop. They don't have access to their rooftop. Um, some don't even have their own energy meter. They don't even get an energy bill. They're on like a triple net and um, they split it with other tenants. So they don't even know what their own energy use is. Um, some of them don't have direct access to the owner of the building. Um, this is going away because now um, they have more power as tenants, but some of them really don't want to rock the boat with their property manager. Um, and some of them don't share the same culture and are really distressful. So um, what are the most common energy switches? Um, I call them switches because have any of you ever read the book like how to um, convince people to switch when change is hard? It's a really good book for people like us. It's kind of like community-based social marketing, but it's it's like how do you convince businesses to make these switches and how do you how do you drive them to do that? But here's the most common energy switches, lighting upgrades. Um, for some reason, our utilities think that those are all done. There's still so many lighting upgrades to be done out there. Lighting controls, programmable thermostats, HVAC service. When you go into a business and you start talking about an HVAC pretty quickly, they'll say, what's an HVAC? So, you know, that hasn't been serviced, but they don't even know what it is. Um, replacing older units with higher sear ratings. Um, refrigeration, all those gaskets are old and worn out and tired if they're even still there. Um, Coils, um, climate right refrigerants now is a big deal. Um, and then upgrading your energy source. Obviously, that's the fun and sexy part of energy. How can you convince them to use cleaner, carbon free, or renewable forms of energy? Um, and electrification now is the big one. So, electrification of hot water. Um, so, heat pump hot water heaters, um, cooking appliances, HVAC, laundry. Um, uh, insulating hot water pipes, on-site renewables, mainly solar, although we are seeing some wind, and then installing EV chargers. Um, and if anyone wants, after this presentation, if anyone wants our, our checklist with our green bit for energy efficiency measure, then I'm happy to share that. Um, okay, I'm going to talk for a little bit about community choice energy aggregators in California specifically, and then I did some research to find out what it is in all of our western states so I could bring it home for all of us here. Um, but what these are in California is basically the utilities, the investor-owned utilities, were not doing a good job of sourcing their energy from renewable or clean sources. They weren't doing enough of it. The public was exasperated because they were moving so slow and they were more interested in um, profits, basically. And so these community choice aggregators popped up, and it was a way for locals to take back control to purchase their own energy, but still have the IOUs transmit that energy. So they maintained the lines, they did the billing, but local people could buy and source the, the energy. And so what that resulted in was a, um, a lot of big um, centralized renewable energy, so solar and wind farms, um, and a lot of local jobs, um, and it also kind of forced the hand of the utilities to start investing in these projects too. And now there are actually laws where they have to provide their customers with an option, 100% renewable option. So here's kind of how they're cropping up in California. It'll be interesting to see actually whether the CCAs stick around once the utilities get up to 100% um, or close to it, because um, there might not be a role for community choice anymore after that. Um, but the vast majority of CCAs right now procure more renewable energy than the investor-owned utilities. Um, so in California, CCAs aren't everywhere, but they're, they're growing. In Washington and Oregon, and tell me if I got this wrong, this is just from my own little internet. 
internet search, right? But in Washington and Oregon, there's um, mandatory clean energy choice from utilities. Arizona, Nevada, and Idaho, there's at least one utility provider that has green energy choice, but no mandates, no CCAs. And Alaska and Hawaii, no mandatory clean or green energy choice, no utilities offering the choice, and no CCA. Did I get that right? Does anyone know? Anyone think different? You don't. But do you have like? Does your um, do you have a mandatory clean energy choice from like? Can you buy from your utility clean energy? Um, so just as a point of reference, the difference between renewable and clean or carbon free is basically this this image. Um, some utilities will talk about clean energy, um, but that includes hydro and it sometimes includes um, nuclear energy, and these, you know, arguably are not as, um, as environmentally preferable as just the, the renewables like solar and wind. Um, a lot have their pros and cons, and there's been many life cycle assessments on all of them, and lots of debate, but that's just so you know the difference. Um, you will see on your bill, like depending on what you're buying, you will see sometimes that you're getting 100% clean energy. So just know that there's some nuclear and some hydro thrown in there. Um, so this is my local utility, it's a CCA, and um, they offer 3C Prime. They all market it differently, it's kind of funny. Um, so theirs is called 3C Prime, it's 100% renewable from solar and wind. And um, this is bar none the best thing we can talk our businesses into doing. It ends up being, I don't know, it's like, for our small businesses, like 15 bucks a month more on their bill for them to go up to this 3C Prime. It can be significant for some businesses. We had um, one business that was like uh, called Bay Photo. It's an old photo processing lab where they actually are still doing silver fixing photo processing. Yes, that still does exist, and there's like only one shop doing it in the country, so they're huge. So for them to do this, it's like $15,000 a year. But guess what? The alternative was to put solar on their roof, which was going to be a lot more expensive than that. So they decided to offer this as part of going through the green business process. So I think this is a really easy sell, and we're talking a lot of businesses into making this transition. And we actually um, work with Central Coast Community Energy. We kind of pre-sell it for them, and then they swoop in and do whatever they have to to convert them to um, the 3C Prime. And um, you can see we're starting to collect data on this now, and we're saving a ton of greenhouse gas emissions, and um, so it's paying off. So that's, that's a really good one that's easy to do on the ground if you have it available to you. And like I said, the utilities, like your utility here, if they're offering the, um, the it's Solar Choice, is PG&E, um, what are some of the other ones? I forget what SDG and E and um, SCE they're called. Here? No, they don't use the windows. Um, but they, they have different names for it, so you can opt in for that as well from your investor owned utility. Um, the other thing we're doing is, and I think I heard um, I think I heard Emily from Bring here in Oregon talk about this too. Sometimes you don't want to convince the business to do something that's gonna freak them out because they'll be like, oh my god, I just can't think about that. That's too much, that's too too heavy for me to think about, are you kidding me? And it'll kind of shut them down for anything you're trying to ask them to do. But if you just ask them, hey, why don't you just get three solar probes? There's like so many outfits out there, Sage Energy, Energy Sage, sorry, is one of them, and they don't even need to come to your business, they just do everything um, you know, online with GIS and um, Google imagery, and they can see what your solar capability is of your rooftop, get three solar posts from three local companies pretty quickly, um, I think in a couple days, and um, they will do the ROI, and then that can sell it, and we've managed to talk a lot of businesses into going solar that would never even consider it if we had cut it up at first, but because they did this, they actually thought about it, and this we're tracking as well, so, you know, 13 million kilowatt hours of energy, and um, 9,000 pounds of greenhouse gas emissions saved. Heat pumps, for water heaters, um, I think we were just talking about this. I think, yeah, we were talking about this before. We were talking about this is something that really easy to save energy with this. Um, we're trying to eliminate natural gas, right? Um, natural gas. And you can save up to 75% of your energy costs with these. Um, 
They do make the room cold, so you have to think about where you're going to put it. I put it in my garage because it also has the added benefit of controlling any mice or rats or anything in the garage. So you want to think about where you put it. Um, my uh, laundry, my dryer, and my um, compete for heat. It's not good. I didn't think about that very well. <laughs> um, so these are. This is a good one that you can talk people into. Um, the heat pumps for HVAC um, is a little bit more involved, a little bit more costly. Um, but say if someone's got a failing HVAC system, or they never had a good one to begin with, um, this is something if they're going to put in a new one. They might as well go to the heat pump. And then um, if you couple it with um, with solar, then this is a really good option. Um, it could be. Um, not as cost effective as natural gas furnaces if it's not coupled with renewables. So it's not really like if you're trying to convince an equity based business who wants to save money, this is not really the way to go. Um, and it also has the added benefit of dehumidifying, which is great for the Pacific Northwest <laughs> and where I come from in California. Um, all right, I talked about this in the last session because we haven't harassed restaurants enough. <laughs> the next thing we got to harass them about is induction cooking, but this actually does save a ton of um, energy and chefs that switch to induction cooking love it, rave about it. Um, there's a lot of demonstration places in California, I bet there's some here where they actually show off this equipment in a showroom and do some cooking with it. Um, so it's great if you can get your chef spot to try it out if you're trying to work with a restaurant on that. Um, it's really important to know thy audience. Um, you don't want to go into a mom and pop guns blazing talking about solar. It's just not going to go over well. Get them some free stuff first. Um, we're about to embark on um, some big energy efficiency retrofits for micro businesses, which is great. A lot of the work that we've done to date is even if the so-called small business energy efficiency, it was really medium and large sized businesses. So now we're going to focus on micro businesses. We're just going to give them free stuff. We're just going to give them free stuff, free lighting, thermostats, service their HVAC. Um, and then beyond that, once they like us and they save money, then we can start talking to them about other stuff. Um, try not to scare a business away. I mentioned that. Um, be sure to find out if a business has any say in anything to do with their electric bill, their appliances, anything. If you talk to them about all that stuff and they don't have any sway on it, then um, it's just going to frustrate them. So um, the other thing you can do, and we do a lot of this in the California Green Business Network, is we um, kind of identify personas that we're used to dealing with. Um, my least favorite, oddly, is the greener than thou persona. This is a business that is like, oh, I'm already green, I'm already doing it. And they won't even listen to anything you're saying. <laughs> and they're not. They, they are doing, like, even, even when we get our own office certified, we have to do stuff. So um, there's always something. It's a journey, not a destination. Um, so like analyzing those personas, figuring out what makes them tick, and how you can kind of overcome your sticking points, I think that's, that's really important to convince them to make some of these energy efficiency switches. And this is our bilingual team in California. These guys are freaking awesome. They do a lot of work. They get a lot of businesses into our program that wouldn't even know about us. Um, and they're very good at what they do and very personable, and um, they're adorable. So they're interesting. So if you have any questions or you want more information, um, happy to help and happy to talk to you. Full circle this panel is you know and some uh, everything is uh, accessible in in its own different way I think but I love the context of how do we bring it back to our small businesses so thank you Joe all right I would like to open it up to a couple questions uh, from our audience uh, do folks have any questions for our panelists yes uh, I was going to ask Dr. Ma, uh, the, the you found that the uh, heavy duty trucks were the largest emitter of uh, greenhouse gases. I was wondering if you had a, any additional breakdown of like other categories within heavy duty trucks and, and where to potentially prioritize electrification because uh, we've seen at least in Idaho there's there have been a, a couple of 
uh, garbage haulers that have adopted it, and I didn't know if you had maybe seen something, uh, you know, like some like those trucks maybe emitting more than like the you know port to inland uh, shipping terminal emissions or anything like that. Is it any, anything in your findings? This question is for Dr. Hunt. <laughs> Uh, yes, uh, our agency has the, uh, the, those type of the, uh, the data, but basically so we, uh, the data we have is based upon our regions because we have the two largest uh, ports in the U.S. So, uh, so that's one of the reasons why we have the heavy uh, dredge truck, which is uh, delivering the, uh, the product from uh, between the ports and warehouses. They, uh, those are the major emission source. I think that uh, it, will, uh, it will depend uh, depends on uh, the, uh, the region, and then if they have a different profile of the vehicle, uh, it will have a, sm a slightly different um, the, uh, the percentage of the each of uh, the vehicle sectors of the emission. Uh, however, uh, the, uh, due to uh, the annual mileage, mileage, and then size of the engine, and how many, uh, how much of the uh, fuel is cons consumed every year, so uh, most of the region has the uh, largest portion from the uh, emission portion from the heavy train truck. And definitely we have the different, uh, the each emission percentage from the different sectors in our region. And I think uh, it's, uh, it's uh, uh, accessible here from uh, the single data from other regions as well. Thank you. Thank you. Another question? Yes. Uh, also for Dr. Uh, this one's for Dr. Ha. Is the, the battery life similar to in a lightweight uh, vehicle of 10 to 20 years for the batteries? And um, follow up, what's the, is there a thoughts on the second life of that, of that battery once it is spent for the purposes of the heavy contract? Yes, uh, that's a great question. question. So, um, so basically, the passenger car manufacturer, they uh, the warranty uh, of the uh, five to eight years of the battery life, and the heavy duty truck is uh, the similar uh, the life cycle warranty as well. But basically, the heavy duty tr truck, uh, the uh, their the three cycle is a uh, much uh, my, uh, much more mild than passenger car. So, for example, passenger car will be exploded very quickly and then break in quickly very again. But the heavy duty is uh, heavy, so their three cycle is very smooth uh, acceleration and smooth braking. So uh, typically, if we use a similar type of battery, the heavy uh, battery pack will have uh, the, uh, the longer the life cycle as well. And then even after the, uh, eight years to ten years of the life cycle from the heavy duty truck, the most of the uh, the truck OEMs they are considering about uh, what's the next the second generation uh, second handed battery. So how we can use that. So the uh, Volvo and Daimler and other global OEMs they already develop their business uh, part uh, to, uh, to use the second hand battery from their electric trucks. So uh, basically one of the idea would be that uh, they will use the second hand battery into the station resources such as the combined solar panel and then uh, the energy storage to be uh, isolated from the grid power it's a so called the micro grid. So yeah, the, the trouble is they are considering how they can use the second hand battery to the maximum. Thank you. Question, yes. Uh, Dr. Han, this is for the M pipe uh, energy guard. Uh, how, what type of maintenance you have to do on the device? Do you help municipalities apply for grant funding, help them check a grant to get your device in, in the water system? This question is for Greg. Okay, thanks for your question. Uh, so maintenance is, is pretty routine. Uh, uh, the system, the Hydro Excess, uses sort of standard components that water uh, service people, maintenance people, are, are used to um, uh, maintaining, like, like pumps and valves. Uh, pipelines and stuff. They, they totally uh, do it already. So we offer a maintenance um, schedule, but it's pretty routine uh, and we uh, have designed our system for the last 30 years uh, with minimum amount of maintenance. Uh, in terms of we, before the uh, Inflation Reduction Act, we worked really closely with uh, water utilities and cities to identify uh, grant opportunities. And there's lots of grant opportunities. Um, but they're very competitive um, and, and time-consuming uh, to go after. Um, with the Inflation Reduction Act, 
it really changes the ball game because up to 50% of the capital costs can be reimbursed by the federal government. So that's half the cost, which um, really eliminates the need to go after grant opportunities in, from our perspective. Thank you. Question, yes. Is a battery required for storage of energy, or is it basically like a uh, water's always on and so it's constant? That's a good question. So um, the amount of energy you can produce is a function of the flow and the pressure. So, um, but, but you always need more energy, right? right. So, so it, we are working with a number of uh, cities that want to tether together battery storage with the hydro excess and um, take advantage of um, completely going off grid, for example, with a pumping station or other critical infrastructure. Thank you. Yes. Another question for Greg. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, can you give me an idea of, uh, you know, you kind of mentioned this, the size, like the don't grow one, 30 kilowatts. Um, maybe, uh, say, a, a small municipality with like 200 residential connections, like how much, how much energy are you talking about? Maybe we'd be able to get out of Yeah, pro probably similar. I mean, we, we've seen, um, uh, like we were doing some work in Las Vegas, for example, and, and you know, there's megawatts of wasted energy in, uh, in a big city like that. But in a smaller city, um, you know, you could think about uh, probably between 100, ki uh, 100 kilowatts, a couple hundred kilowatts. And then if you use a battery, you could probably take the whole town, you know, off, off the grid. Okay. Yeah. So we, have, you, have you talked to any towns like No, I haven't. I haven't. But if you know any, we'd love to. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah, for sure. Thank you. Any other questions for our panelists? Yeah, one. Yes. Uh, for Dr. Ha. Dr. Ha, huh? Um, has anybody considered putting solar panels lightweight solar panels on the vehicles so when they're out there in the warm hot California sun they're generating electricity which could help uh, recharge the battery while they're in use. Does that make sense? Yes, uh, that's a great question. So yeah, I exactly have a similar uh, project on a, I have a whole project with that. So basically the, uh, the, the energy required for the uh, for powering the vehicle is not enough by the uh, generating by the solar panel. However, so we have this small project for developing the electric TRU. So basically the electric TRU you know, needs two different types of power uh, for the propelling the vehicle itself. And then the other one is the, the operating the refrigerator as well. So two operate the refrigerator, so they are installing the solar panel top of the, uh, the trailer. Yeah. And then yeah, they can use the solar panel um, electricity for to operate the yeah. As well. So yeah, we have the um, both type of project, and then so we are going to have the future another the application of the So even if the solar panels couldn't fully charge the battery for the truck, could they partially charge the battery? Yes. The, yeah. TLU again. So they uh, they have very long uh, charge uh, the parking time sometimes based upon their oper operational schedule. So in that case like the California and Las Vegas, they are getting about sunlight while they are parking. Yeah. So yeah, partially, yeah, you could charge uh, the uh, battery for the problem with people as well. All right, well, let's wrap up our session for today. Thank you so much, Srihar, for joining us online. Thank you for being here and talking about hydrogen fuel cell technology. Thank you to our speakers, Dr. Ha, Joe Fleming, and Greg. Thank you so much for being here. It's, it's really amazing to see how far technology is coming. And it's great to also think about, from Joe's perspective, how can we incrementally help businesses adopt these technologies and our communities adopt these different technologies. So thank you for sharing your perspectives. Let's give them a round of applause.